Uh, my name is Peter Smythe, I work for the UK Data Service and I'm going to be presenting this webinar today. What we're going to look at in this webinar about putting data on maps is what kind of data do we want to put on the maps, what kind of maps do we want to put the data onto, we look at some data formats and then we'll give a, a very short presentation demonstration using Google Viz which is a, an R package and then we have some more extensive demonstrations using Leaflet which is another um, popular R package for visualizing maps. So what kind of data? In order to create a map we need two kinds of data and a way of associating, associating them with each other. We need the data we wish to put, show on the map, possibly the results of research. We know, need to know how it relates to the map. That is, is it as a single point which the, on the map which the data refers to or is it an area of the map normally uh, denoted by a polygon on the map, some outlined shape something like this or any other enclosed space. So let's look at points first. Um, they're very easy to deal with. You just need to know the longitude and latitude or some equivalent um, coordinate system of the point. And here's an example of a, a little spreadsheet and you can see here what I've got on the left hand column there are postcodes for parts of Aberdeen and you can see on the right hand side I've got two columns for one for latitude and one for longitude. So this is sufficient information for me to, to use the longitude and latitude as a series of points and put any of the data, other data associated with that particular row um, on, onto the map. So a polygon is an ordered series of points and you join the dots. In practice you don't actually have to join the dots because the software packages that you're using will join the dots for you. Um, they can be very large normally depending on, on how accurate you want these outline shapes to be um, um, drawn in. Uh, each dot itself represents a longitude and latitude value just like a point that we've just seen and the idea is when you join the, the first and last dot coincide as you join them up you'll create an enclosed polygon on the map. Of course having got the polygon you still need a way of associating some data with that particular polygon. It could be anything as we saw before, as the type that we saw before where we just had the longitude and latitude but now that information is going to be associated with an entire polygon. Um, in many cases there will be some continuous or discrete variable which you wish to represent as a coloured polygon on the map and we'll see an example of that in the demonstrations later on. So what kind of maps do we have? We have static maps, essentially this is just a picture of a map area and you put your data onto it. This is essentially a snapshot because once you put it on it just becomes, put the data on it just becomes another um, picture with the embedded data onto it. There are R libraries which will do this for you or help you do this such as R world map, GG map and there's probably many others as well. The alternative is a static, a dynamic map. This map can typically be scrolled and zoomed so you can move it around the screen just like you tend to do um, when you're looking at um, Google type maps. In fact Google Maps will work as well. Um, and the, the information that you display on these maps can also be changed depending on the zoom level and where you are in the map. Um, example R libraries for this are Google Viz which we'll be seeing later on and Leaflet which we will be seeing later on but again there are many more to choose from and which one you choose will depend on your um, preferences and, and, and knowledge of the particular packages. So what kind of maps? In both cases the initial map may need to be downloaded from the internet so when you're doing this kind of work it, it's quite likely that you're going to need an internet connection um, on your PC. Dynamic maps typically make use of a web browser to display them. This is because that it makes it easier for them to implement the scrolling and zooming because you're, you're making use of the, the browser functionality rather than having to code everything in R. And 
in fact, although you all can write them in R in the packages we, we've mentioned before, the dynamic maps are often written in JavaScript code in the background, but that's entirely hidden from you um, in when you're writing the R code. But it does explain why you tend to need the, the web browser. Sources of map data. Well, you can get map data from the UK Data Service. Um, the link is here. Um, in particular, the, the census data has a whole section on geography and the various regions of geography specifically for the UK. Um, you can go to Ordnance Survey themselves and they, they will also have similar um, sources of maps and uh, gazetteers and, and what have you. Um, GeoNames, um, this site is a more global and a bit more generic and gives higher level value um, type data, um, typically based on longitude and latitude, but you can probably go and find any country in the world and get the longitude and latitude of all of the, say, the major cities and, and places within any given country going from Google, from GeoNames. Um, there are, of course, many more. Um, you can go to Google and get shapefiles. Um, shapefiles are used for um, the dynamic maps, as we will see later on. Or, or not so much the dynamic, dynamic maps, more the polygon-based maps. What we need to consider, we need to consider the data that you want to put on the map and the map data you have, and how you're going to match them up. So regardless of whether it's points or areas, it will most likely be tabular data, as, as we saw before. You can put any amount of data on the map you, you want to, in theory, but in general you probably want to limit this to three or four items, otherwise the map just begins to get too cluttered. And as I think we mentioned before, if it's an area denoted by a polygon and an area on the map, the chances are you're going to want to use the fact that you've got enclosed spaces and colour those enclosed spaces and the colour will represent in some way one of your data items. It's not, not obligatory but it tends to be what happens. Um, and I say this could be continuous or discrete but you probably won't want to use too many colours. It's, it has the same effect of having too many data items, it just becomes too cluttered. You need a very large um, legend somewhere on the map to describe what all these colours represent and it just gets a little bit messy. So we've got two basic choices for the map data. Uh, the simple one is the points, and these are just the longitude and latitude as we saw in that um, little bit of a spreadsheet earlier on. Um, you may have different coordinate systems, but depending on your software, you may have to convert them. So, for example, some of the um, specialised GIS type software systems may handle the conversion themselves, but in our case, when we're looking at these R packages, certainly Leaflet, you will have to make sure you have converted whatever your system A is into longitude and latitude. Um, and again, longitude and latitude, they're just two columns in your table of data, as we saw before. Polygons, these are the outlines area of the map. You could create your own, but most often you find them in what's called a shape file. And these can be downloaded from the sites we mentioned earlier. Although there's actually a shape file involved in this, shape files are normally delivered to you, downloaded as complete folders. And the folder contains not only the shape file itself, but also a .dbf file. And it's a .dbf file which actually contains the data related to the polygons. And they're automatically matched up when you load them into packages. So here's an, a little example of one downloaded from the UK Data Service. Um, what it refers to is the um, England parliamentary constituencies of as they were in 2011. Um, the, the, the clipped means they're the, um, the smaller versions, if you like, the not such granular um, outlines of the, of the polygons. But even so, you can see from two thirds down the, the shape file, .shp, this is nearly, well, over four and a half megabytes in, in size. So these files can get quite big. Um, so I've said several files, including the shape file and the DBF files. They're the two key ones. Um, they are proprietary formats, and you need appropriate software to read them. But of course, 
as we're going to see we've got packages in R which will do that um, and as I say most GIS and R libraries will combine these two files together so that you can ease or it will the software will associate the, the correct polygon with the correct entries in the DBF file so you don't have to do too much work on that if we want to add data um, for the point system it's just a case of adding new columns to your table which already have the longitude and latitude in them for polygons it's a bit more bit more complex but can be quite simple it will depend on the software in use um, for leaflet in R the DBF file is exposed as a data frame and we can add columns to it in a standard R like way and then having added our own data into this DBF file we can actually save the whole shape file again from the R from R and then that will include any of the changes that we've made and we can make that make use of that in the future so we'll just talk a little bit about leaflet before we go into the demonstrations um, originally leaflet was written to be used with JavaScript and it allows written it allows maps to be written as HTML pages and displayed using a web browser, which is what I suggested earlier on. But now um, it, it's such a popular library, it's now being converted and made available for other languages such as Python and R. And we're going to use the R version of that later on. Um, the functionality may differ between the language implementations, but generally for mo most of the the usual and ordinary and common things that you want to do. You, you find all of the functionality you wanted certainly in the R implementation. You can certainly create a web based map um, on the provided initial coordinates and zoom levels so you can move around, you can zoom in on the map, you can uh, move the map around on, on the on the on your canvas or your of your web browser. You can add a, add pop up markers to the map and, and the pop up marker typically will denote the place and then it allows you to within the market to have the data associated with that that point on the map um, the official documentation is at this site here leaflet.js.com there are other that will of course give you the, the javascript documentation for the original package if you want the leaflet for r specific documentation then you can get that from the r studio github site and if you want to find examples you can just google it um, um, but here's an example of some um, on the Bing website um, you can just do a search on R and leaflet and map examples and it will show you a whole host of, of the types of maps that you can actually see on um, or create using the um, leaflet package demonstrations I'm going to show you a demonstration using Google Viz which is an R library it was originally designed for, for to interface with R charts but it does have some um, simple mapping facilities in it um, then we're going to have a, a more detailed look at leaflet and here I'm going to lead you through starting right at the beginning of simply loading the library the leaflet library and take you through the various steps needed in order to end up creating a, um, um, a dynamic map and saving it as an HTML page. So there's lots of steps and we'll go through them one by one and you'll see how it all builds up. Um, that's going to be for the pop-up data and then we'll do, do another one a bit quicker using uh, for a, a choropleth map and this is where we're going to use the polygons and we're going to colour the polygons depending on some item of data that we have got associated with the polygons. This is our first demonstration, a very short demonstration using the um, Google Viz library in R. Um, I'm just going to Google Viz library. We're going to use data from um, which is in provided with the library itself, and this is data called Andrew, and it relates to the Hurricane Andrew of 1992, which blew in from the Atlantic and onto the um, coast of North America. I'm just going to run all of this code in one go and see what it produces and as you can see it immediately well, as the code has run it has opened up a web browser for me and it has mapped the whole series of data points on the map 
if I click on individual ones it tells me the state of Hurricane Andrew at that point so out in the Atlantic here it was still a tropical storm it has a pressure of 994 millibars with a speed of 60 knots and each each one of these points has similar sets of information associated with it notice how the map manages to move all by itself as I click on the point to center the point I've clicked on so the map is a, uh, the background map has come has been downloaded from Google and then the points have been added to the map and then it's been displayed as an HTML page in the web browser. So back to the code, um, the code itself which actually draws the map is this GVIS map function and you can see I've essentially given it two um, parameters here one's called that long and one called tip the rest of these these options are all essentially default options so we won't go into that but what I do want to show you is that the data for Andrew which is now a data uh, frame up here if we have a look at that what we can see in here is this lat long um, column which we use and this is essentially just a combination of the latitude column and the longitude column it's, it's done this way because that's just the way that um, Google Viz expects you to provide latitude and longitude and the other thing I want to show you here is that this tip here which is actually the category and the, the pressure and the speed combined together as a single string uh, separated by these BR um, things and what this actually represents is what is going to appear as the data when you click the pop-up and the reason these BR codes are in here is that this is, isn't just text this is HTML code um, which gets interpreted as such so this BR has the effect of putting data on new lines which is why we saw it as three separate lines and not just a, a continuous string and other packages use similar me methods of, of allowing you to in, in what you want to display you set it up as an HTML string and then that HTML gets interpreted and put on the map um, or the HTML page in which the map is included in, in the appropriate manner so we'll just leave that one behind us now and go on to our leaflet demonstration and what we're going to do here is we're going to slowly build up um, a map of points and this is just really to demonstrate how, how you build things up so again I'm going to start off just by loading the leaflet library and then the first call to leaflet has no parameters it's just leaflet by itself and if I call that all I end up with is essentially an en empty canvas down here the only, the only clue is that I've done anything is a slight change in colour and the fact it's got leaflet down here in the bottom corner next thing I want to do is add a map to this and I'm going to do this using the add tiles function you see how the, these just build up using the, the piping command from Margrita um, it just adds the different calls onto each other and then eventually at the end I'm going to call whatever is in M and just I'll display whatever's in M so here I'm just adding a map and the default map is this continuous map of the world again it's, it's got the country outlines but nothing else of any use next thing we're going to do is is say we want where we want the center of this map to be and we're also going to specify a zoom level so that will tell us how much of the map we see and the, the, the degree of detail um, but it, the map itself this map itself is a genuine map in that I can zoom in on it it expands um, if I zoom in on, on the UK you can see it as I get into greater zoom levels I get more detail just like you do on, on any uh, map on an HTML website okay and what we're going to do now is we've set a specific zoom level and a specific center point on here so when I run this I get a zoomed in map and this happens to be centered on Greenwich in 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 London so the next thing I want to do there's still no data on this map so I'm going to add a little marker to the map based on this pop-up value and it's just going to say hello Greenwich um, I've also changed the zoom level slightly so now um, in the middle of Greenwich I've got my one little marker if I click on it it says hello Greenwich 
next thing I want to show is the point I was making about the, the pop-up values that we're going to use this Hello Greenwich it doesn't have to be simple doesn't just have to be simple text we can actually put HTML in there so here I've changed it to a bit more sophisticated HTML where I'm going to have two lines I'm going to have Hello Greenwich in bold and I'm actually going to have an HTML link in here as well so if I run this what I end up with is the same map, same point, but now if I click on that, I've got Hello Greenwich in bold, and on a new line, I've got a, a hyperlink here. And I can click on that, and that's a real link, it works just as you'd expect it to, and it takes me to, to a website here. Now I'm going to close down and go back to here. Now putting on single points like this doesn't really make a, a great deal of sense. What we're typically going to look to do is read data from a file and the records in that file will include the longitude and latitude and the data about that longitude and latitude that we want to put on the map. So here I'm going to read a file um, which has Aberdeen postcodes in it. Run that. I'll just show you what Aberdeen looks this Aberdeen data frame looks like. I've got my postcode down here I've got a few more little bits of information and of course crucially I've got a latitude and longitude because I need that in order to put the point on the map on the map. Oops. So now I'm going to instead of using my individual points um, and add markers here I'm now going to tell it to use the data in Aberdeen data frame uh, for longitude I want to use the column marked long and for the latitude I want you to use the column lat and then the pop-up is the value of PC which was the first column we saw so now if I run this uh, bearing in mind this has 4991 observations in it if I run that we get a very cluttered map of um, markers but any of the individual markers if I click on it will give me the postcode for that particular marker these are all different postcode areas. So far so good. Um, what if we want to put more than one bit of information on the map? Well, as we suggested, what we need to do is we need to change the pop-up value to from that simple um, postcode into a more sophisticated bit of HTML. Now I'm not going to try and explain all of the HTML but this is just a standard way of creating a table. Um, there's plenty of, of HTML um, tutorials that you can find online if you need to know more about how this is being set up but for this first example of it all I'm doing is I'm hard coding everything I've just read the first line um, of the Aberdeen file and I've manually typed in postcode and the first postcode value and then the name and the first name and admin code and so on okay this is really just to give a single demonstration so if I just run the pop-up value here um, all I'm doing is just to set that variable really doesn't do anything much but then when I use that pop-up value in my map and again uh, I'm, this is just a single point on the map what we can see is uh, the single point if I click on that I now get the information all of the information that I put into that pop-up value HTML string so I did slightly change the set view um, position here that was just again matched up for where I knew that point was going to be on the map so now we're going to do something very similar but this time instead of just using a single point we're going to use the all of the points from the data set Aberdeen so now instead the table structure is going to be the same but instead of hard coding the the values I'm going to take them from the Aberdeen uh, data frame other than that this is very much the same as the previous um, example when I run this what I end up with is my very cluttered diagram uh, uh, map again we'll, we'll talk about the cluttering later on at the end but now when I all of these individual points have all three pieces of information in the same format. I'd have to say that, that, that the colour in the background again that you can change the colour in the background if you want to. Well you can set it to whatever you like really. Um, the next thing we want to do is um, 
instead of, of having to code all of this in the call to um, to leaflet and add markers uh, function what we can do is actually add the pop-up value into a new column in our Aberdeen data frame and essentially this HTML is the same as we've just seen but instead of putting onto a map directly I'm actually going to add it in as a new column into the Aberdeen data frame now that may um, it will obviously increase the size of this data frame which may not be a good thing for you but um, it does tend to make the code a lot cleaner to run because now and all we have to say for the pop-up is again give it this pop-up column name that we've just created in this data frame so if I run this oops, including that last M what I get is an identical map in fact um, for the same identical information on it the only difference is now this information is stored as part of the of the data frame so if I look at that data frame now I've got seven variables and this last variable is the string which represents the pop-up value here which is an HTML table um, finally we need to deal with the cluttering problem so what we're going to do here instead of using add markers we can use the function add circle markers and add circle markers is only slightly different from add markers in that it has a radius to say how big you want your circles to be and it has effectively um, clustering options and there is a, a convenient default clustering function here called marker cluster options which I'm not going to try and change I'm just going to let it do its own thing and create this clustered map so if I run this what we get is the same background map but instead of um, instead of all of the individual uh, markers appearing at once they've been clustered together into regions uh, based on the density and then as, as I click on or just hover over um, one of these uh, circles it gives me the outline region which is covered by it and if I click on it on a region it will actually expand the map and expand the cluster into smaller clusters or even individual points so if I click on this point I've that is one of the individual points and it's showing me the information for that individual point and that is it for the um, the pop-up version of leaflet so the other thing we need to look at is the Coropleth version. Well, I say version, it's not really version, it's just a different set of calls that we're going to use. Um, and more importantly, we're going to use a different type of data set um, when we try to um, put the map, the data onto the map. Um, just to, I'm just going to clean up what I've caused so far, just so you can see what we're doing. okay and this little uh, file here again I'm going to run it one piece at a time so I'm going to start off by loading the leaflet library and this other library called rgdal and when I run that of course nothing happens particularly the reason I need rgdal is that this function here read OGR is a function which knows how to understand shape files now this, what we're going to do here, we're going to read a shape file into this variable called England. This shape file has a, a parameter which is the folder name of where the shape file is, and then it's also got a, a parameter called layer, which actually represents the name, which it has the name of the shape file itself without the dot shp extension. Okay, so we're just going to read that uh, into a variable called England and what you can see here is that it's read it in and what we end up with is something called a large spatial polygon data frame it has 533 elements and it's 6.8 megabytes long and if we um, just expand that and have a look at what's inside there there's quite a lot inside there but the point I want to uh, bring to your attention is this first part here data is actually a data frame of 533 observations with three variables and alt name code and, and code name and code are the three variables and what this actually represents is the contents of the dot dbf file 
that forms part of the shapefile folder. The rest of it, the polygons, is, as you might guess, it is a list of 533 different polygons and each individual polygon has a whole series of coordinates in it. This, this first polygon has 833 points in it and these points are, are, are the coordinates which are going to be mapped out and joined up to form an enclosed polygon. Now the downside of this data is that it the coordinate system being used by this shapefile is not longitude and latitude. It's a, an ordnance survey based map, so it uses ordnance survey system of eastings and northerns, which are these values here. And so before we can actually use this in leaflet, we're going to have to convert this into longitude and latitude. And that is the point of these next two bits of lines of code here. Um, I'm not going to go into detail about what all this represents, but essentially if you have northerns and eastings as your coordinate system and you want latitude, longitude and latitude, as we do want, these are the two lines of code to run. And then at the end of that we can see that down here now I've got um, essentially these are values of longitude for the various 838 points in this polygon. And of course they're all very similar um, because the po in terms of longitude and latitude the points are very close together. Um, the next thing we need to do before it's worthwhile drawing a map is we need some data to put on the map. Now I, I could use um, one of these but these are typically have come with the shapefile and you tend to only want the shapefile to get hold of the polygons. The data that you're going to want to use is your data. So what we need to do is add data into this data frame. And this is where the fact that it is just a standard R data frame works in our favour because we can use any of the usual techniques for adding data uh, or columns of data into an R data frame. Um, in this particular case, I'm going to take advantage of the fact that one of the things in the polygon is the area of the polygon, the area down here. And all I'm going to do is add that area into this data frame here and just scale it up to make the numbers look more reasonable. So that's what this sapply function is going to do for me. You can use any other function, which you know, any other method of adding data into this data frame. Okay, so as you can see, I've got this extra variable called area, and that's what I'm going to use to colour my map. Let's just shuffle this up. Um, I, I would point out at this point, I'm not going to actually run it, but this write OGR, the counterpart of read OGR, you can use that to actually write a shape file of your own. So now, if you think about it, what I've done is I've added my own data in here, and I've converted the the coordinate system to one I can use, it might be worthwhile saving this to a file for future use. I'm not going to do it in this particular case, but it's just a simple write OGR, um, the name of the this variable, the spatial polygon data frame that you want to write, and a, and a location to put it there. Okay. The next thing I am going to do is I'm going to set up my colouring system for my map. Um, so I'm just going to create a variable called PAL and I'm going to give it a, a palette ranging from yellow through to blue. Um, it's going to be based on the area value and I'm going to split this up into 10 bins. Um, how many bins you have is up to you. The colour scheme is, is, is up to you. But as I said earlier, you probably don't want to over clutter the map with too, too high a value of N there. So if I just run that, nothing will happen, appear to happen anyway. And then I'm ready to draw the map itself. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to call leaflet. Now this time, uh, instead of just calling leaflet without any parameters, I'm going to say that the data I'm interested in is this variable called England, which is a large spatial polygon data frame. And then I don't have to keep specifying that um, as I go through. Um, add tiles as the default, but I'm setting the view and a zoom level so I've got a specific part of, of 
um, the world if you like in this case hopefully most of England um, I'm adding my legend to the bottom right of this map uh, using the power color system I've just set up and it's going to be based on the area um, from the data in England um, I've got a title and an opacity um, and then the important part is adding the polygons and again the, I'm going to colour the polygons, this fill colour is going to be based on the area and the colour scheme I've set up in this PAL var variable. Um, this colour down here, um, this FF0000 is just the line, the colour of the lines which are going to separate the, the various polygons or, or or, or for the outline of the polygon. In the case, this, this represents blue. And then the pop-up is going to be the name, um, which is taken from this data frame here. And name is, in fact, the um, UK, the English constitu parliamentary constituency. So if I run all of this, what I get is after a while, because it draw all these 533 polygons, I get a nice little map, or big map, of England, and it's colour coded based on the area size of these constituencies. So you can see that in in the London area that were all yellowish, these are the the smaller area sizes, and then as we go out to the darker area sizes, up say in in Cumbria and the Thumbland, far larger areas. So when you consider that um, a, a parliamentary constituency has or, or, or shaped or, or made up to have approximately equal numbers of people in them, then essentially what we've got here is um, a population density map of the of the of, of England. So obviously far more densely populated in the London area and Birmingham and and the Manchester than it is in. Cumbria and, and the Thumbland. But of course you'd be putting your own data on this and your own representation of, of the legend and what have you. And so that ends our last demonstration. So thank you for um, watching and listening to this webinar on putting data into maps. <laughs>